Today, we are facing an unprecedented use of New Age practices, beliefs, and attempts to engage with demons. Why has there been such a widespread acceptance of this among our youth? Ouija boards, spells, attempted levitations, tarot cards, YouTube groups and TikTok pages devoted to witchcraft, etc. are all on the rise. Over 70% of Americans say they hold New Age beliefs. And in preparation for this episode, I searched metaphysical supply stores near me and found not one, not five, but 22 stores within a 20-minute drive of my house. True, the yearning for the mystical experiences is built within us, but without the church, her spiritual weapons, and her truthful teachings to guide each of us, everyone is at risk. Learn about this unfortunate situation that affects each of us and what we as Catholics striving for holiness can do to better help our confused world. Stay with us. Hey everyone, another episode of The Catholic Gentleman is coming to you now. We are grateful for you being here. We're so grateful that you've decided to take some time to listen to us. If this is your first time, please click that subscribe button wherever you are. If you're listening on YouTube, definitely hit that um, a bell button so that uh, you can get notified when each of these come out. We'd love it if you gave us a five-star review on Apple uh, Podcast or Spotify Podcast. These sort of things help expand the show to reach more men. And I, I just want to start by saying it is such an incredible blessing to do this in my life. Um, I'm John Heinen. I'm the host of The Catholic Gentleman Show here, and I'm joined by a great friend, Charles. We're going to talk about him in just a little bit, but it is just such a huge blessing to use the digital means to reach tens of thousands of men in this capacity. So thank you for being a part of that. Thank you for listening in. We hope you gain something from this show, and we look forward to um, uh, all the new and future things that we're able to do to help men in the church. If you are looking to support an organization, The Catholic Gentleman would love for you to prayerfully discern. We've launched a um, membership program for men called Catholic Gentleman Plus. We are actually going to do a full um, month devoted to spiritual warfare in that. It's coming up uh, next year, but we've got a ton of things on prayer and fasting and uh, self-mastery and things like that already in there. We have guest experts that are coming on. So dropping that in the show notes, but catholicgentlemanplus.com would be a great way to support the ministry and and hopefully learn a lot and grow in holiness. So anyways, today I'm excited to be joined by my friend, Charles Franny. He joins me to discuss the occult and how our fallen, our sinful, saturated world, saturated in sin, um, allows the demons to just play on our wounds, our lack of commitment, our lack of knowledge, understanding, and just the numerous curiosities that affect us. It has grown exponentially in previous years. Charles, why should we listen to Charles? Well, he is a man who's written like an uh, award-winning book, a bestseller, we'll say that, uh, on, on slaying dragons, which is on demons. The biggest book on demonology that I have, I, I haven't div- dove into the subject matter like he has, so I'm sure there's other large ones, but it's it's pretty phenomenal, and we've been blessed to have him on the show previously, but he's got this new book, and he's got this new topic on the occult that we're going to dive into, and us Catholic men, us Catholics uh, need to stand in the breach. We need to be aware of this stuff so that we can bring others to the powerful love of Christ. And so, Charles, how are you doing today? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, John. It's great to be here. Doing pretty well. Awesome. And so Charles is already aware I had a bunch of technical difficulties uh, lined up and trying to get this whole show going uh, more so than I've had in quite a long time. So we did some binding prayers and uh, and we're, we're ready to go. So Charles, start with the basics. What is the occult? Um, what is the small? I know you call it soft occult. Uh, what is mm-hmm. that small versions, the horoscopes, those sort of things, and then building to the large things? And and is it that widespread? I think that's another thing that just, you know, we go about our days, we're friendly with our neighbors. They're not Catholic. We just assume that they are, um, you know, doing their best just as we're doing our best. And we kind of ignore some of these realities unless they've got huge crystals in their front yard or something like that. So I'd love, I'd love for you to talk to us about what is the occult, how we define that term, and then, you know, how it and is it that prevalent today? Yeah, uh, so several good things to start with. Actually, I posted um, a little summary of all the, the big statistics that are in my book. 
Um, that's on my website. I'm not on my website, YouTube. So I have a YouTube channel I'm trying to build up. The Slaying Dragons Apostolate is where you can right. find it. Um, but the statistics are quite alarming. But let's first start with um, what it is. So in, in the book, I talk about soft occult and um, dark occult. I'm not sure if it was hard occult or dark occult, but there's basically a spectrum. And that's the way the devil lures us. You know, the first thing he's going to do is tempt us with the easy things, with the things that we're not going to see as diabolical or we're not going to go, you know, um, buy a Baphomet statue as the first step towards occult practice. So in the book, I developed this image called the, um, well, it's not an image I came up with, but the funnel model. So it's a business model where the easy or businesses give away things. Um, that are cheap, they're free, then they're bait. It's bait for you to subscribe to their website, to sign up, to follow them, to buy their bigger products, which cost more. So the occult operates very similarly. So on the, the edges, and I also compared this to a, to a pitcher plant, which is a carnivorous mm. plant, which is very fascinating. Um, so the, on the edges of this funnel are things like astrology, uh, manifesting, uh, the new age, but if you look at the new age, it really is twisted. Even it sounds like you know the age of Aquarius is this fun new revolutionary thing coming. Everybody's happy, everybody's supporting each other. It's a big community, but it's really twisted and dark, like yeah. just below the surface. So this edge is a soft occult, which people are going into. Uh, Self help is a big part of that. That might come up later. Um, but th that sounds like so benign self help. No, no, because that's a lot of self help today is I don't need God, I just need myself. And well, that's occultic, that's an occultic mentality. So then you start there, and then one of the things about the occult is it's very addictive, it's habit forming because sometimes the demons will do things, sometimes manifesting that's where you exert your will upon the universe or whatever you want to call it to make things happen that you desire. And sometimes Christians um, end up doing this as a corrupted form of getting God to respond, which is another fascinating aspect of this. Yeah, we'll um, spend time talking about that. I, I completely agree. It's, it's kind of eye-opening how this is not just um, the agnostics and the atheists, but but Christians, people who believe in Christ, can can fall into this. So yeah, we look forward to diving into that as well. Yeah, so it's it's a that one of course is a, a perversion of some things that our Lord has said. You know, ask and you shall receive. Well, you know, so if you ask and you don't receive, it's like, well, maybe I'm not doing it properly. Then you come up with this ritual, and that, you know, is a perversion. Is a one form of superstition is a corruption of right worship. Another another form of superstition is you know worshiping demons or using trinkets and things that have nothing to do with Christ. So there are two kinds of superstition. Um, yeah, so, so manifesting all these other things, horoscopes, the demons will sometimes, they're allowed by God to, to show up, to do things, to give an answer, um, to cause something to happen in your life that has no natural explanation. And that baits you in. And then what the devil does is eventually, um, very quickly corrupts your morality. So in the occult, there's this forfeiting of objective truth, a forfeiting of, of morality that should govern things. Even if you were a Christian, straying from the church, going into these things, you'll quickly abandon uh, the morality because, well, it's a spiritual warfare that's happening. It's working on your mind and on your will. And you'll want, uh, one of the things the occultist, the former occultist told me is that the devil will respond, but then he'll back off. The demons will respond. They'll back off. They won't answer anymore, but they answered once. So then you want them to answer again. You want to get this result. So you'll do something darker. You'll be more willing to, let me try this. So that didn't work. Let me try this. And there's this downward ladder that you can easily take. You can easily find these things because um, with the Internet, like so much evil information is out there. Curious kids can find black magic in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And if they try it out of curiosity, well, you know, they're dabbling with the diabolical. So it's actually some people like one one guy I spoke to is Gabriel in the book. I gave them all pseudonyms to protect their identity. But yeah. he started with the new age. And when he and I were talking, he was like, um, he said, I, I didn't really, I sent him a questionnaire, which I sent to a lot of them. And he said, well, you mentioned a cult a lot and I didn't really go into the occult. But then as we spoke, he's like, well, actually I did go into the occult. I just didn't want to admit it. And wow. because he had all these, all these parameters, like, I'm not going to do that. That's what witches and Satanists do. But then he realized, no, I, I was doing that. I was summoning demons. I was uh, talking to wow. spirits like, and he almost got possessed. Like he was heavily oppressed. He may have been mildly possessed and was delivered very easily in the process of converting, but wow. he started new age and quickly went down. So it's kind of yeah, a quick that, overview. 
Yeah, the, and I appreciate it. And that's an, there's two things that come to mind, and and that was actually you know kind of a a, a very extreme story. This um, Gabriel that you um, brought up, but um, I don't want to set the the tone that like every single person is doing that. It is very dangerous with just things like following your horoscopes, practicing yoga, you know, astrology, Ooh. these sort of things that that I remember growing up. And seeing the horoscope and finding it kind of funny and cute, you know, within the newspaper articles and stuff like that. And so, but these are all open doors. And you said something that I thought was was really great. You talked about, you know, you're entering into the black waters. And then you said, but you realize those black waters don't clean off unless you have a supernatural solution, which we're going to get to. But I liked how you described it as kind of like this, this tarry, you know, substance that you've plunged yourself into. And, and so I, I want to just... Take a moment and talk briefly about those small entryways that we allow demons into our lives that not only as we as Catholic men, but also we need to be aware of within our relationships with others uh, to to just be uh, cautioned of. And so if you could talk about just a couple of those, I'd love to um, spend a little more time there. Yeah, the the subtle entryways into uh, a cult. Yeah. So... Um, is both cultural and intellectual, you know, even sin, sin, like, what was it? St. Alphonsus Liguori, I pulled the same quote for slaying dragons as I did for the rise of the occult, because he talked about um, vice is essentially a form of idolatry. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, a vice in the heart is an idol on the altar mm -hmm. is, is the expression he uses. So the more sinful we become, the more we are um, pushing God away, like quite aggressively. And that's setting the stage. I mean, if we have to look look at what Lucifer did, look where Satan came from, where look where evil emerged. It was this being who glor gloried in himself, thought he was the best, and then ran with it and ran away from God and stayed there. So when we, it, so for us, it begins with pride. You know, pride is the the first crack in our spiritual armor and our spiritual reliance on God. And if we indulge that and inflame it, it's going to produce all kinds of vices. Like it is the capital capital sin. Uh, everything flows from that. So then we decide, you know, I like that teaching. I don't like that teaching. Um, and then we we eventually com commit a, a certain form of apostasy that we never admit to. Uh, I, I think it was um, John Paul II called it the uh, silent apostasy that it had swept the church. And that was back in like the 90s, I think it was. So sin, sin is the basic entryway, the basic door opener. And then one of the things I talk about a lot in the, in the book, the, the occult is becoming such a big problem because Christianity has been uh, corroded, has been removed from the culture and from our lives and has been replaced. So when we're living in a state of sin or we're proud and we're, we want to control our lives, we, we don't want to depend on divine providence. And then the occult is out there, you know, at the um, touch of a button through these smartphones and because um, yeah, there's, there's some other things there, then it's easy to, to fall into it. It's easy now. It's a, it, think about pornography, how accessible pornography is. I mean, just the, the quickest temptation can lead you straight into actually indulging in it. Like the same thing with the occult. It's easy to go. It's like there's, you know, cocaine and crack just like being distributed from vending machines at the high schools. Like that's how, how quick we can get into deep, dark evil once we set the stage. Yeah, I think that was great. I really appreciate you bringing up sin as being that gateway, right? I we don't see that, and we think about the uh, the need for confession. We need the need for you know absolution in our lives, and we think about all the Christian and Protestant denominations, let alone uh, the atheists and agnostics and stuff like that, who don't have the richness of of the faith and traditions. But but for us men, it's so important that that sin is that gateway. Wow, I think that's you talk about it in your mm -hmm. book and we're often looking at like Ouija boards or, you know, rabbit feet and stuff like that, which are superstitions and Ouija boards even more so, you know, uh, um, uh, diving in to try and communicate with, uh, you know, the, the dark world. But, uh, it is so important for us to, 
you know, have this dialogue and conversation right from the beginning that it is sin that is driving us there. You also talk about in our fallen world some other things. And I know that when I was uh, diving into learning about uh, the fallen nature of man, we talk about our our separation with ourselves and God, our separation with ourselves and others and um, created things. And I know you talk about that in the book. So I'd love for you to talk about a little bit about how our fallen world uh, just opens us up to to this darkness and opens up other people to to the occult. Yeah. So the as we know from scripture, the three main sources of temptation: the world, the flesh, and the devil. So uh, the devil is working on all of those. I mean, he's he's behind. He's not just him because we sin, we destroy things too. We set up a terrible world uh, through our own evil. Um, but so the world itself, which before um, before the coming of Christ, is was dominated by what the church calls the kingdom of Satan. And this is a very important thing that I found when I was doing research for slaying dragons. Pope Leo XIII clearly taught that we are living in a world which is is experiencing a combat between two kingdoms, the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. And when you enter, when you follow Satan, when you follow Adam and Eve, the fallen human nature, the, the fallen aspect, then you enter into that kingdom of Satan. And we have, um, this this war of extraction. Christ is trying to extract us from that kingdom. And this is really what the, what I see in the battle with the occult. And I use that image a lot uh, throughout the book. Um, but so the world itself, especially now, so the world is very conditioned now by evil, by occult mentalities, even if they don't come right out and say that they're part of the occult or, you know, have pentagrams or Baphomet statues or talk about, you know, transcendental meditation. Right. But at the same time, you do have some people more and more now. There was the, like the, what was it, the mayor or governor of New York, whoever it was, mm-hmm. uh, was promoting um, yogic breathing in the schools. And then he admitted to being, you know, this is what I do when I do my transcendental meditation. I'm like, oh, okay. Wow. You know, this is, this is just, I put, put it on Twitter. I think it extracted uh, a video clip, but so the world, um, we, we really have to, and this is one of the things I talk about, the spirit of gullibility. A lot of parents just trust that the world is intrinsically good mm. and that they, you know, if, if they sell it at Walmart, uh, it's probably fine. If it's on Disney, it's probably fine. If it's on the news, well, I'm sure they're telling the truth. Like, no, all of those things are not trustworthy. Like, there was one um, uh, murderer who was a, a Satanist from, uh, what was it, the 80s, and his mother was interviewed, and she was like, you know, I just assumed that if he bought this music at Walmart, it was fine, like that the culture's not going to corrupt him. But then he was listening to all this death metal, and it drove him insane, essentially. And he ad- admitted that the obsession over this kind of music made him satanic, made him crazy, because he absorbed the philosophy, the mentality, or the words, and it, it drove him, helped drive his choice for evil. So we have to be very, very on guard. And it's, it's, it's a great burden. It's a cross that Catholic families have to carry now. To, to not hover, but hover over their kids at the same time because there are so many dangers. And even for adults, I mean, this is a very um, indulgent culture, materialistic culture. We, like you can order, and like my kids, they're watching us like, oh, we need something, we'll order it on Amazon, it'll be here tomorrow. And they're like, what? It comes that fast? And then they want, they want, like, order this because you can do it. Just push buttons, it comes tomorrow. I'm like, no, yes. But no, like, yeah. it's not a good thing. How do you explain that to kids when, when you're using it and they see us with the phones and like, oh, that's fascinating. Technology's everywhere. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a magical mentality. Mm. Like, I push, I do this and this happens and God has nothing to do with it. And it, it really is confusing, especially in a culture that doesn't pray, that has pushed God out of the schools, like, thrives on things like abortion and all these sexual deviancies. It's really a twisted world. And and this can corrupt us, can discourage us. Discouragement is a huge factor that can cause us to stop praying. And then um, little by little, I mean, that's what the devil wants to do. Little by little. I think I've heard like Chinese water torture Mm. is like where they drip a little drop of water constantly on the head of the prisoner and drives them insane. That's the devil's best technique, because if he can break us, well, then he'll just watch us destroy ourselves the rest of the way. Um, and, his, and back to what we were talking about with sin, sin is the goal. His goal is not to get the whole, the whole world to become you know, witch, witchcraft focused. His goal is to get us to sin so by whatever means he can come up with. If we sin, 
we separate ourselves from Christ and then the devil feels like he wins. And in one sense, he does. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things that we wanted to talk about in this episode, which you kind of hit on, was just this desire for uh, mysticism, for the transcendental that we all experience, whether you're an atheist and you've actively denied it, or you're an agnostic. But we all know we have that sense of curiosity. I think... um, you and I both know as Catholics that God has placed this within our hearts to search and find him, right? And I know the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and I pulled up the the quote right here, said, you know, God's free initiative demands man's free response, for God has created man in his image by conferring on him, along with freedom, the power to know him and love him. The soul only enters freely into the communion of love. God immediately touches and directly moves the heart of man. And you go into all of that because it's written within our hearts as we are created beings in the image and likeness of God, and we have this yearning to know something more. Yes, it's it can start and be dangerous with curiosity, but it's there to find him. But like you were saying, in our perverse, perverted world, people fall short, and the yeah. church isn't standing into the breach to, to help guide and direct them. So I know I just went through a lot right there, but let's talk a little bit about that desire for mysticism You know, that's kind of written within us and that lack of finding it in authentic truth that is leading individuals into this um, you know, dangerous practices. Yeah, and you can see it. It goes back to, to Adam and Eve, which is so great. It's one of the things I, I it's like, how do I not, when I do my research, I'm so shocked at the things I've never heard. Like, it seems like they would have taught me this in um, my master's degree program, or even when you're a kid, like CCD, of course, I didn't have a lot of Catholic education. But going back to Adam and Eve, like uh, Father Ermatinger, uh, a great priest, he wrote a book called The Trouble with Magic, mm. which was one of the first books I read that kind of really woke me up to like, wow, this is a huge reality in our world. And I quoted him uh, several times in the book. But he said, Adam and Eve, when Eve took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was the first superstitious act. It was an act of magic. She Mm -hmm. thought that if she ate this fruit, she would become a god. And that's a disproportion or whatever you want to say. uh, The cause does not merit the the effect. The cause is not powerful enough for the effect you're desiring, which is kind of the definition of superstition. Mm -hmm. You have a rabbit's foot pocket and you think it's going to protect you or bring you good luck. Well, that's just ridiculous. So eating a fruit is not going to turn you into a god. But this is what the devil tempted her to do. So superstition, this desire for uh, power, this is desire for knowledge, desire for supernatural qualities, uh, which God promised. So you see both things. God promised it to us because that's how he made us. He wanted us to be in union with him. He promised you will get this. You will be divinized. You'll become one with me if you just obey me. You know, I'll live with you. State of grace, state of innocence, state of justification, all that that they had in the beginning. Um, but the devil introduced an, a, a counterfeit because he, he tempted her. He, he baited her towards the fall, which they were going to go towards, um, and baited her with a counterfeit, which is the occult. The occult is a counterfeit religion, counterfeit system of rituals. Because he, the devil knows that we are mystically driven. We want God. We are creatures de- destined for worship. Uh, it's a virtue, the virtue of yeah, religion. That's it's, right. It's, it's something we owe God justice. And I remember learning for the first time the virtue of religion. Like, really? I've never heard that. Like, it's again, one of those things. Like, why didn't I know this? Me either. It was, um, yeah, it was an episode not too long ago where we brought, we brought up the, uh, it was actually on five uh, Roman, uh, you know, ancient Romans and the different virtues that they displayed. And, and Pompilius, we talked about religious religiosity, but we went through Thomas Aquinas talking about, yeah, the virtue of religion as a justice owed to God. And likewise, I, me growing up all the way into my young adulthood, I had never heard that, never, never understood that and and what a what a again um, what a lack of a firm foundation or at least shield from these curious you know leaning uh, uh, ploys that Satan uses to to try and um, bring us into that without right mind and right thoughts. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah, I am just right there with yeah. you. Yeah, and you gave me an image um, when you were just talking how. Um, that the whole world, we say like, I think it's the book of nature. I'm not sure who used that phrase, but God speaks to us, to the, to the heart and soul of humanity, every one of us, through creation. It's like he's 
painted this huge calling card, this huge billboard. The whole world is this billboard yelling at us like, I am here. I am good. I am true. I am beautiful. I am loving. I am wise. I am powerful. I can protect you and shelter you. I want to give you everything that you would ever need. And so the whole world is screaming. The whole created world is screaming that God exists and God wants us. He wants us to want him. And so that reflects the, this intrinsic, innate desire for us to worship, um, to be good, to follow rules, to, to have rituals, to have order, to have discipline, to have customs, to have um, symbols, to find everything having meaning. So when that's gone, this is the problem we're dealing with now. Like when, if you look at the, pro the progression or the negative progression, whatever that yeah. is, the digression of, of philosophy down from... Thomas Aquinas, as I always learned it, he was at the high point, faith and reason, then faith and reason started to tear apart. Yeah. Then you had the exaltation of, of reason, and in the Protestants, the exaltation of faith without reason. So there's this, this huge divide, and then it has plummeted down to nihilism, which is where we are now, yes. and as I say, the next step is Satanism. Mm. I mean, because of this this call to worship is going to emerge within this absolute despair where you feel powerless, you feel vulnerable, you feel weak, you but you don't want that. You want you so that 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 the fallen nature combined with nihilism is going to like this is going to explode perhaps. Yeah. And I haven't really thought it out completely, but it makes sense because that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the occult as the next step after nihilism, with this huge rise in rejection of Christianity. Uh, is with anger. A lot of people, the former cultists I talked to, had an anger at God, which would flow from a nihilism that cannot completely give in to atheism. They know God exists, yeah. but they hate him now. Mm. And then that will flip to Satanism. Maybe that's the, the way to, to find the link. Um, yeah, because that, that's what, what kids are growing up with. That coercive yeah, so, power yeah, of, well, of I hate. Thought, uh, yeah. yeah, and and you see that. It's, it's very corrosive. Like, um, and hate can emerge from this culture of divorce, culture of abortion, culture of identity crisis, which has been going on for like 60 years or more. And it's this generation of hate. And yeah. the, the, the children we're looking at now, like when I was teaching um, theology at Catholic high school for 10 years, like divorce was an issue that I couldn't find a way to talk about because I knew that too many of the kids were um, in families that were divorced. And there was one time where I did bring it up as gently as I could. And one, one kid excused herself from the room. And then another one, another friend went with, went with her. And they told me later, like, well, her parents are divorced. And she just, she can't, can't endure even a gentle conversation about it. I'm like, well, how do you deliver the truth to a, to a generation that's so broken? Mm. Um, and, and that's... Yeah, no, I, I these go. are these are the 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 challenges of our time, right? We brought up a couple now with like uh, technology and the instant access and our and our children and that, but also like you were saying, like bringing up truth to our neighbors and stuff. But before we kind of go into you stepping into the breach, you have a whole chapter about how we we can do that, and and I certainly want to talk briefly about that. But I want to talk going back to the mm -hmm. occult and talk about the the perversive similarities, like that, the uncanny similarities to the sacraments and sacramentals within the church. When you really get into this, I find it so fascinating. And I, I kind of understood that. So I used to live in Kansas next to a neighbor who was a fallen away Catholic. He was a fallen away Catholic. Him and his wife um, were married and he had crystals all throughout his yard. And I'll never forget one day I went over to his house. Uh, he was a really nice guy, a really nice guy. And I went over to his house and I just went to say hi to him. And he was wearing boxing gloves, but sparring gloves. And I was like, oh, cool. Are you working out? And he said, oh, no, you're going to think I'm crazy. And he opened up his gloves and he had these, these crystals inside of his gloves. And he was telling me that he's been sick forever and he feels like these crystals are going to pull mm. the impurities out of his body and then he can bury them into the earth. And I mean, like, I was, I didn't even know how to respond. I was like, wow. wait a minute, what? But I was touched by the, the aspect of a sacramental in his life. Now I, 
initially thought it was because he was a fallen away Catholic, honestly, in my ignorance, this is over a decade ago, was that he was a fallen away Catholic and he was used to the rosary and he was used to statues and things of that nature. And so these crystals kind of took that void. But then as I've grown and matured in my theology and also in, you know, what you talk about in your book is that obviously the need for these incarnational um, tangible aspects Mm -hmm. are what help our faith, but unguided, without right direction, we still have that yearning with in our heart, and and so we start creating these uh, uh, false and uh, demonic substitutes for them. So I'd like for you to talk more about just kind of that, you know, even with some of your stories here, some of that uncanny uh, practices and and um, situations that people found themselves in, even going as far as as having these apparitions of angels at what they thought were angels, dark mm-hmm. angels, and in praying with them and stuff like that. I mean, it, it is that slow and steady drip that you were talking about that Satan utilizes uh, to bring us into this realm and into this blindness and darkness that that he wants us to reside in. Yeah, so this goes into the um, to the counterfeit, to the to the authentic faith and the counterfeit faith, and it's it's uncanny because I've done a lot of research. And I'm still hoping to do more on sacramentals, the the, the forgotten treasure of the church, mm-hmm. which is totally abandoned nowadays. It's it's kind of ridiculous or diabolical, really, yes. that this would all be abandoned. So that's one of the things that, um, just a little foretaste of where we're going, like one former cultist said, if I had been raised with the traditional Latin mass and the traditional sacramentals, I never would have gone into the occult. And that was her like deep guttural feel. Like mm-hmm. if she had been given these things when she was a kid and her whole vision was painted with grace instead of with superstition, then she would have never left the church. She would have had a holy life, but... Um, as a result of her going in there, she got to tell her story, and I got to interview her, and she got to make a point that other people can hear to avoid it. But, I mean, the, the occult has everything in a mockery of the faith. Like, um, we have blessed salt and holy water. Well, they they use, there's something called uh, moon water that uh, witches use, and which pulls the, the uh, power of the moon at certain phases of the moon and gives you certain qualities that you can use it. And there's also, like, ghost water, which is, I don't know if that's in... Rise of the Occult, or um, yeah. I'll give a little cameo for the book yeah. cover. Rise of the Occult, or I'm working on, this was originally, just a little tangent, um, 800 pages when I did the, <laughs> finished my research. And wow. I can't publish that, so this one is like 350. So I have so much more material that I'm working with for hopefully, God willing, uh, what I'm calling Slaying Dragons 3. I don't know what the title will be, but yeah. um, so moon water and ghost water, but they also salt and black salt. I've never seen what the black salt actually is, but yeah. um, with similar kind of concepts, but perverted, like a, a, sage, a sage smudging, burning sage bundles that have been... Um, blessed by some witch is supposed to pull the impurities out of the air so that it's all like so the occult is entering not satanists let's look at at wiccans and witches like they're trying to enter into some kind of spiritual warfare but they don't label it properly like they don't believe in demons they don't believe in satan but they believe in good spirits and bad spirits so they set up all these protocols to try to get in touch with the good spirits and the goddesses but they're acknowledging that there are these bad spirits out there and One uh, person, um, a former occultist, she said, she remarked, like, why is it that with all these occult practices we do, we have to set up protections while we do them? We have to have this sacred circle to protect us from spirits we don't want to come in. Um, So why is that? Like in the Catholic, and that's one of the points I made at some point, like in in a lot of former occultists, when they convert, they're like, wow, the church is so calm and just, you know, peaceful and gentle and kind like even the rituals god himself everything about it and then because they come from this this occultic uh, world which was wicked and like some of the rituals involve you know shedding blood and intentionally harming yourself or destroying something or killing something um we don't so it's it's not simply a counterfeit it's a it's a diabolical inversion uh, flipping good to evil and flipping evil to good and it messes with your mind and all kinds of things but so they they go after that because they want the incarnation of grace like you were saying they want the incarnation of the supernatural they want channels to god or to the gods or to the truth or to mysticism whatever it is they want portals and they don't realize that well god has established that through through the Eucharist, we can go and see God face to face through receiving Holy Communion. He can come into us by going to confession and being in a state of grace. We are 
uh, branches attached to the vine and the supernatural life of God's flowing through us and bearing supernatural fruit through us, like miracles, healings, you know, whatever God wants to do freely. Um, but, and of course, one of the inversions is that they want to control it. They want what they want. They want to get what they can get. So it inflames the pride, back to what we were saying earlier. It inflames the self. And um, they become gods all throughout the occult. So that's the other inversion. You know, so many inversions. You know, God wants to divinize us as creatures tied to him. But in the occult, they want to become God, God himself, gods themselves, totally independent, which is very Luciferian. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they're craving, they're, they're craving power. They, they believe there's something more than just, you know, the bark of a tree and the wind caused by the change in cold and heat. And then more than just science explaining everything away. Like one of the guys said that that's what the youth are being given by the world, this very uh, sanitized, bland understanding of the world. And everybody knows that, that that's not that's not enough. It's not satisfying. So if Christianity is not there, they're going to go looking for some spiritual answer. And that's where the occult is like, well, we got incense here. We got water. We got salt. We got crystals that have power. Uh, if you want to go really dark, we have all kinds of deeper rituals that will get you in touch with spirits. And of course, it all backfires. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to write The Rise of the Occult, because it, it all backfires. It all collapses. Yeah, I can't not. And and you remind me of uh, Archbishop Fulton. I believe it was Archbishop Fulton Sheen who stated, right, when we remove the rosaries, we get Mardi Gras beads. When we re pull nuns out of their mm. habits, we get ma women in maxi coats. And he was just talking about that this perversion in society and in culture, but yeah, specifically within liturgy, right? And I, I just feel really called for us to go into that direction and talk about um, – and liturgy, because we see this perversion of liturgy within these practices, um, and and we also see it entering into our church. And I do, I want to talk about that, because I do believe it's really important for us to understand the authority that the church has, and how we as men and women can stand into the breach. We can help bring people to the overwhelming love of Christ. We need to be aware of the substitutes, um, or falsehoods of it, within the church. And you just brought up sage smudging, and I was at a huge <laughs> Catholic conference uh, in November of last year, and they had some sort of uh, Native American ritual. So if, if you know what I'm talking about here, it was in Los Angeles, and I was it was at the beginning of Mass, and this, this deacon, uh, sorry, he was a deacon, sorry, he was an ordained deacon, but he was practicing this, this sage smudging right at the beginning of, of, of Mass with some sort of like, I don't know, openness to God and stuff. I mean, it was, it was awful. It was awful mm. that that thousands upon thousands of high school youth were exposed to this. But I want to talk a little bit more about things like lack of catechesis, uh, lack of. We already talked about lack of the use of of the treasury of the church's sacramentals, uh, but some other things that that you mm. you go into uh, that have kind of gone by the wayside and or directly entered in from the occult uh, into the church. Yeah. So you mentioned. Um Sage smudging. Un unfortunately, there's too much on in the headlines now about in the infiltration. I mean, the, the word the infiltration is the best one of the occult into the church. And chapter three, four, and five, I think. Uh, so the occult has infiltrated the world is chapter three, and then the world and the occult have infiltrated the church. Mm -hmm. And then obviously chapter five is the situation is dire. This is from from the book. So sage smudging, we've seen, um, well, with all it really began with Pachamama, or maybe even back to whatever year that was with JP2 and the uh, Assisi peace thing, where all of these religions were welcomed under the guise and with the approval of the Pope. And they, what they were doing, so it's, it's kind of, a, I don't know if it's a religious indifferentism or if it's just a stupidity because <laughs> you see them invoking yes. demons, invoking their spirits. Mm. And like, well, uh, the tradition of the church is like, those are demons. Like, why are you permitting it? So it really goes back to JP2, unfortunately, yeah, uh, because he was such a great pope. Like, but he did that. I don't remember if Cardinal Ratzinger did as well as Pope Benedict. But then you have Pachamama which is this, this huge cataclysmic event that exorcists were like, what, what is happening? And, they're, they're, and I, I quote that, I think it's in Slaying Dragons, but actually I released Slaying Dragons a month before, actually a week before Pachamama happened. Wow. I didn't know it was coming. And that was off my radar, but yeah. Divine Providence, I released it on 
um, September 29th, St. Michael's Feast Day, 2019, mm-hmm. and October 4th was the Pachamama Synod thing that happened. And then since then, you've had more. You've had uh, cardinals. You've had um, like Mother Earth spirit indigenous leaders come up and stand before a whole bunch of cardinals and lead them in this invocation of Mother Earth, and they put their hands over their heart. Um, and then Francis went to Canada for some indigenous recognition thing, and they had a, uh, an elder doing a sage ceremony, and the language is very occultic. I mean, it was very yeah. clear. Like he was summoning the Western grandmother and the spirits of the four corners, welcoming them to be with us. Like that's that's a, that's another religion. Those they, are at this demons. event that I was just talking about. There was the whole four corners, and it was like uh, turning to the four corners, and also, but but there was some sort of like Catholic prayer that was added into it. Um, I guess we can't call it a Catholic prayer, but there was some sort of a um, a Christian prayer that was supposed to make it okay, like adopting this sort of pagan ritual, and mm-hmm. and then bringing it into. You know, we're like somehow unifying uh, really pagan idolatry and demonic worship into the richness of of the Catholic faith. And it was it's I mean, just hearing you talk, just it it does it does disgust me. And, you know, our listeners might have experienced some of this themselves. And I'm just going to go out there and state if if you experience this, talk to the Holy Ghost and, and probably leave, you know, probably leave that lead that example of 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 not not sitting through it and and assuming that mm-hmm. you're not opening yourself up to something um you know in these situations of course we've talked about deliverance prayers and we've talked about binding prayers and we've talked about father ripperger's um, book deliverance prayers for the laity but nevertheless this is tough stuff so charles yeah why don't you continue <laughs> Yeah, and there was one thing, and I don't think I brought it into the to the rise of the occult. I think it's in my extra material I'm working with now. Is um, when Francis went to Canada, like there was an article where they interviewed whoever was there in Canada that arranged it, whatever prelate, whatever cardinal it was, and he tried to explain away the sage and tried to interpret, reinterpret it as if it were a sacramental, and like, no, this is not a sacramental. You can't just state, and 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 then similarly. Um, this is in the new material I'm working from. Um, a South American diocese posted a prayer. Uh, the diocese, some organization within the diocese, posted a prayer to Pachamama, mm. and I think it was in the couple years after 2019, and it was reflecting something that Francis had said about Pachamama and about taking religious symbols, indigenous religious symbols, and Christianizing them. But if you read the prayer, it was it was pagan. I mean, Mm -hmm. it just threw in the Virgin Mary's name kind of randomly, but the attributes of this deity and even the way it identified us, we were, we were like beasts. We referred to as beasts of mother earth and the mother earth is the one that brings forth all of the goodness that we desire to feed upon from her. And then they just threw in the Virgin Mary's name at the very end of the prayer. I'm like, this is so clear, but... One of the things, I have some quotes in there from, I think I printed one out, um, Cardinal Burke in the book, I think this is chapter four, he talks about how the church is um, not, here we go, he said, the world has never needed more the solid teaching and direction which our Lord in his immeasurable and unceasing love of man wishes to give to the world through his church. But... um, The confusion and error which has led human culture in the way of death and destruction has also entered into the church so that she draws near to the culture without seeming to know her own identity identity and mission. And that that's where we are. Like some of the former cultists, they as they were converting, they went to Novus Ordo parishes, as they called them. And they're like, what? What is this? And as exorcists themselves said, like, that can do harm to a yes. former occultist. If they yes. go to one of these bad example churches, they're going to flee. They're going to return back to their rituals because and you can almost say, uh, objectively, the modern mass lacks the ritual of the traditional mass of the church. Yes. So no wonder they're trying to bring in sage and other ritual things because they can almost sense the void. Like we've lost something, but they don't have faith. So they just grab from the culture things that look hip or popular. They might bring in people. They might make them stand out, which is that that self self-worship thing. Yes. I mean, to, to go to a pagan ritual and think that that's going to fulfill the Novus Ordo Mass with that void, it reflects a self-glorification. 
um, a lack of faith, um, a, a really disordered soul. And the fact that it's happening so widespread and not being condemned, like we're, we're definitely in an age where that, that I can't figure out age of the church, age yeah. of the world, you know, yeah, uh, apocalyptic conversations happen as Agreed. a result. And I would say well, you've heard the underlining thread here is that we have this desire built within our hearts. We have this yearning, but we also have now generations upon generations upon generations of lack of catechesis, of lack of clear direction, mm-hmm. of lack of, of appropriate use of sacramentals. And I'll, I'll be the first one to throw out there that I was an adult before I started praying the rosary daily. I was an adult before I got enrolled in the brown scapular. I was an, ad- I was an adult before I actually went to the traditional Latin mass for the first time. And I remember mm-hmm. so clearly being moved by the reverence and the, and the details and the beauty and the intentionality of the mass that I just had never experienced. And I'm not talking, I'm not looking back at my parents or others and saying that they are culpable for doing this because it's, we're talking about, about just generations right now. But let's talk a little bit about what we as men can do and what the church still has in her treasury and in her powerful ability, because you know a lot more about this than I do. And I'd love to hear from you about, you know, how we can start changing the tides and how we can start working towards not only helping uh, the church, but also creating this this foundation, this bastion of, of authentic truth that groups like uh, individuals who have fallen into the occult can then, you know, start looking towards. Yeah, and I really think it goes to rediscovering these treasures and embracing them. So, and also becoming. So, like you said, what can we as men do? I mean, the the courage, the fortitude that we need. Uh, what is that that our Lord says that the kingdom of heaven is taken by violent men? Mm-hmm. So to to really conquer yourself and enter the kingdom of heaven completely, it's it's a violent action against yourself. That's fasting, prayer, renunciation, self discipline, self mastery. We're very coddled, weak creatures. A very coddled and weak generation. Yes. So the and to and to be and I've always said this for the last like twenty years, and I didn't really understand it twenty years ago when I was saying it, but I feel like one generation. And this might be us, though to do it is like embracing martyrdom. You, we really need to give it all up. It's like, and this would be the heroic leap of faith, just give up this material world. Not the Benedict option necessarily where you retreat from society, but you know, not have internet, not have phones, um, not have TVs in your house, um, not indulge in fast food. Uh, it may be kind of an agrarian, you start farming again kind of thing. I don't know how it would play out, but we really have to, to man up because we're, we're weak in two ways. We're weak in nature and we're weak in grace. Yes. And we're weak in the knowledge. Like we don't apply the sacramentals. We don't, but we're, we're, we're up against, it's an uphill battle. Like the, the church popularly throughout the world is not helping us do this. So to, to read the traditional Latin mass and the traditional um, calendar and sacramentals used to um, cover our whole year with grace, with opportunities of grace, moments to pivot around grace, to look forward to things. There was no ordinary time. It was all ordered explicitly toward a new feast day coming up or a season, um, ember days, like everything revolved around God. God was infused in everything. And practical atheism was one of the best things I think Pope Benedict ever said. If, I think he was the first one. Mm. Like, we're, we're Christians, we're Catholics, whatever we are, but really, if you look at the way we live, we're atheists. Yeah. And I really think that's the key, and that's hard. Like, I was not raised, I'm not sure about you, but I was not raised with religious language, with religious sentiments, with religious um, implications to everything I was doing. I was kind of raised in this practical atheism. No fault to my parents. That's right. the culture. So to go against that culture and like say God willing all the time and, you know, um, may God be praised or, you know, praise God for this, just not flippantly, not casually, but integrated in the way we live. Like that's that's tough. I've tried to do it. I've thought about it. But there's this like uh, fear or this. I don't know. Maybe it's just I don't have the wheels already established and, and I'm not able to just change like that so quickly. But I think it is a, a lack of fasting, a lack of discipline. Like if I, you know, I write all these books that talk about spiritual warfare and fasting, but I don't fast nearly as much as I should. Yeah. 
And I think that's what you're saying. Like we need to do what we know. Agreed. I'm just going to jump in there and, and you and I are both fallen. We're both uh, similar age and, and coming up with a similar life story um, as far as it comes into relationship with the church and in our faith life. And you're exactly right. And even when uh, we dive into fasting, very often it's the temptation to, I call it nibbling around the edges, right? Where you hadn't made a good mm. plan the night before. And so you know you're going to make a small meal, but that small meal just becomes snacking on a bunch of little things. And then it becomes kind of like a large meal or or you do fast appropriately and then your dinner becomes like two dinners or you eat one dinner and then a couple hours later you eat another dinner you know because you did you you fasted for a good amount and it's it's we have um we've grown soft i like that but i also think that uh, our society is and the temptations and the ease of access makes it so much more prevalent and available now I also want to talk, I want to spend a little bit of time in the last um, few minutes that we have here talking about more of the rich treasury of the church, um, from the traditional Latin mass to uh, the sacramentals. And I want you to have a moment to just talk about how we as men uh, returning to those things is going to help um, bring about the change, or at least what are those things that we should be looking at? Yeah, so of course, first, attending the traditional Latin Mass. And it, often nowadays, because of what's going on from Rome, I mean, that's another evil thing. It's hard for people to do that. So let's just table that because it might not be an option for a lot of people. But the other things are, is, is getting the sacramentals, getting the real traditional prayer life going. So establishing certain days where you're going to fast and be real about it. You know, don't be, sometimes I think we're so heroic during Lent sometimes. Yes. And then Easter comes and I don't see fasting again until the next Ash Wednesday. Right. Like sometimes I'm that bad. I'm like, it's it's really bad. So be reasonable and be small, maybe baby steps. Start with those things. But get holy water. Get the symbols throughout your house, throughout your life. Try to integrate. Now, this is hard, too, just given the culture with raising kids. Like the daily rosary is, is hard with little kids. Like we're all, it's a constant struggle for me. Like maybe we should do it in the morning. Maybe we should do it at night. Maybe I should just do it on their behalf. Like maybe we should do one decade or maybe just a Hail Mary is good enough, you know. Because, so yes. just, you know, it's, it's hard there, but get these things here, get them into your house, holy water, blessed salt, uh, crucifixes, make sure your home is adorned the way the church wants. Your home is supposed to be a small monastery. Make sure it is. We I mean, don't go over the top and think you're obsessive, but, you know, have a picture, have an icon here and there, every room, a crucifix in every room, some statues. I mean, it's great. It's enriching and it's a sign value. It reminds you constantly of what you're all about. Even at the moments when, especially at the moments when you don't want to do it anymore or your mind is so taken off on something else and then you see the crucifix and a little statue of Our Lady, you're like, oh, you know, life really is good. You know, God is good. It's going to be okay. You know, I'll just, I need to hunker down. Um, That's right. So the, and follow the, follow the liturgical calendar, get, get plugged into that. Um, and there's some, there's some great, great ways to do that. The, um, all the calendars in our house have both the ordinary form and the extraordinary form stamps, all that. So you know where the traditional feasts are and what the modern are. Um, yeah. So I think uh, that, I that sacramental life. Agreed. And live that sacramental life. And one encouragement that I'm going to give is that when you start doing this, when you put up the good fight and you actually struggle with the spiritual weapons that the church has given us, your life is transformed. The ability to say God bless you and really mean it mm -hmm. becomes transformed. The understanding of, of Pax Christi or Pax Ed Bonum or these sort of things that have been around um, uh, ad morium de glorum or yeah, glorium, uh, you know, that all for the glory of God, these sort of phrases and stuff like that become you become capable it's kind of they try to start transforming you start mm -hmm. praying hail marys you know when you're in the shower you start <laughs> you start finding yourself doing things that are just kind of transforming you and then that transforms culture and so uh charles i'm just so grateful for you joining me today uh putting up with the technological mm -hmm. difficulties that we've run into oh, but yeah. where can people find your book uh the rise of the occult here where can they go to uh to pick one up uh not only to support you but also to learn uh a little bit more so that they can be more equipped on how to handle these things and how to see them uh, when they start presenting themselves in often small ways, you know, um, within the, the their lives. Yeah. So the, um, the, the best way to find it is at my website, um, slayingdragonspress.com. So it's my publishing company. It's, it's all my, my thing, but I have six books now. So I, you know, 
just decided to run, change the name of my website when I post when I published uh, The Rise of the Occult. So slayingdragonspress.com. You can buy directly from me. Happy to sign the book. Of course, no charge for that. And sometimes there are discounts. Uh, if you sign up, uh, I have a, an email list there. You can sign up. Also, my books are on Amazon um, soon. It, uh, Slaying Dragons is pretty much everywhere yeah. right now. Uh, the Rise of the Occult soon will be. I've, I've got that finally being distributed better. Um, and then my, I have a YouTube channel. Please go and subscribe there. The more subscribers, the more chance of being monetized one day, God willing. I'm yeah. trying to put more content, content on there, but it takes time. Uh, I'm kind of a low-tech guy, so I, I, I do my best. But uh, Slaying Dragons Apostolate is the YouTube channel. And I'm on Twitter, Facebook, I'm trying Instagram. I'm not very good at it, but you can find me there with my name. Yeah. Um, it's hard. It's hard yeah. to bring Christ into the digital space when at the same time we're trying to distance ourselves from it. It is a daily battle uh, for me as well. And yeah. I, I particularly don't love these platforms either, but I know that that Christ and his light can be brought to them. So anyways, uh, Charles, thank you so very much for joining us today and sharing uh, your, your research and your wisdom and knowledge on these subject matters so that we can uh, grow in holiness and become uh, better men for ourselves our families and our neighbors yeah well thank you john for giving me the opportunity it's been uh it's been good to be good to be back good to have a conversation again yeah likewise well as we end each of our episodes be a man be a saint god bless